folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 70, Assistant God. Investigators are continuing to do their follow-up on the Shannon Street Siege. Before we get started now, as always, folks, if you get a chance, please hit that subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it. Get down in the description, click on that link. You can come follow my podcast, visit my Facebook site, my website, buy a copy of the book, copy of the documentary. If you felt like a little history lesson, be sure and click on the link down there for Snowy and Boone. All right, folks, let's, uh, let's get started here on this episode. On Sunday, January 16, 1983, 10.30 a.m., a typewritten statement was taken from Fred Lee Davis and is here too attached and self-explanatory as part of this case file. January 16, 1983, 12.45 p.m., typewritten statement was obtained from Joe E. Coleman, Jr., which is here to attached and self-explanatory. Sunday, January 16, 1983, after the address of Tyrone Henley was obtained from Fred Davis, an East Precinct car was contacted and requested that they go by 3085 Yale number 12 and attempt to locate Tyrone Henley. If he was located to accompany him to the security squad office. On January 16, 1983, approximately 11.45 a.m., Tyrone Henley, male black, 27, date of birth, 4-14-55. Yale, number 12, was brought to the security squad office by uniformed officers. At 11.50 a.m., he was advised of his rights by Sergeant Hammers, Sergeant J. Hammers, by reading the advice of rights, at which time he did sign a waiver of rights form witnessed by Sergeant B.O. Wheeler. should be noted that Tyrone Henley was allowed to tell, allowed a telephone call, at which time he called his sister-in-law, Doris Montgomery. I'm sorry, but uh, if I'm getting ready to interview, to interview a homicide suspect, I'm not letting him use the phone until I get my interview interrogation completed, but whatever. On Sunday, January 16, 1983, 12.55 p.m., Tyrone Henley was under arrest and advised he would be charged with assault with intent to commit murder. January 16, 1983, at 1.45 p.m., Tyrone Henley, after being advised of his rights, and the charge didn't make a typewritten statement to Sergeant J.L. Collier and J. Hammers, which is hereto attached and is self-explanatory. On Wednesday, January 19, 1983, 8.15 a.m., the rioter while in the security squad office received a phone call from Bob Graham, administrative assistant to the director. Patrolman Graham advised that he had received a call from a Miss. Louise Davis, who is employed at Transworld Industries, and that's at 3639 New Getwell Road. Patrolman Graham stated that Miss Davis advised that she was interviewing a Miss Ada Virginia Wiggins, female black, in regards to a job application. According to Miss Davis, while she was interviewing Miss Wiggins, Miss Wiggins told her that she was a cousin of Lindbergh Sanders. Miss Davis told Patrolman Graham that she did not know the reason why Miss Wiggins started talking about the Shannon incident and the reason she told her she was a cousin. However, Miss Davis stated during this interview, Miss Wiggins advised her that she had been to Lindbergh Sanders' house on the Saturday before the incident occurred. She said there was approximately 37 people in the house on that Saturday. 
Ms. Wiggins also made the statement that on several occasions while in Burke Sanders' house, she had saw people tortured. Yeah, that's what I'd want to talk about on the job interview. Patrolman Graham advised he thought he should pass this information on to Sioux Security Squad. On Wednesday, January 19, 1983, approximately 10.55 a.m., the writer was instructed to interview a Miss, a Mr. Gary Michael Nova, who is employed at the paramedic for the Memphis Fire Department. Lord, that's terrible. Who is employed as a paramedic for the Memphis Fire Department. That sounds a little better. And this is going to be in regards to a call he made to 260 Tillman. The writer interviewed Mr. Gary Michael Nova. Lord, all this address information. I'm not going to read all that, folks. That's ridiculous. We'll go on and end it here, and we'll go to the next page. Folks, before we get started on this page, I, the reason I, I don't want to read all those addresses and telephone numbers and all that, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been doing that lately. I just, I just takes away from the story. Now, it's important that the information, obviously, is because this is what the officers refer back to in their records. So it is very important to the case. You should document everything. So I didn't want you to think it's not important. It is important to the case. It's just not important for our purposes here. Anyways, enough of that sulking by me. Let's go on. We'll get going here. Mr. Nova advised the writer that on November 24, 1982, while working out of number 13 Engine House, located at 333 North Parkway, he received a call at approximately 2 p.m. in regards to a sick party at 260 Tillman. He said at this time his partner was Private Jimmy Jarnigan. He said that after arriving at 260 Tillman, he entered the apartment and observed approximately 10 to 15 male blacks sitting in the room. He said he also noticed the Bible on the round coffee table and male black with a beard, who he thought to be the leader, was reading from the Bible, and he heard several of the other male blacks sitting around saying amen. He said when he entered, the male black who appeared to be the leader, and who he thought he recognized as being Lindbergh Sanders from the picture that was in the newspaper. He said Lindbergh Sam- Sanders, or the male black he thought was Lindbergh Sanders, looked up at him as he entered the apartment, he said he advised this party he had received a sick party call and this male black looked at him as if he knew nothing about a sick party. In a moment, a male black entered the living room and advised that the sick party was in the back. He said while in the living room, he noticed several liquor bottles and also wine bottles. Stated there were, there was all males and no females in the apartment. At this time, a typewritten statement was obtained from Mr. Gary Nova and is hereto attached and is self-explanatory. That sounds really cool. I, I never I never put that in my supplements. I, I guess I wasn't cool enough. But Anyways, on Wednesday, January 19, 1983, 11.05 p.m., while in the security squad office, the writer received a phone call from Patrolman Bob Graham, who is the administrative assistant to the director. By the way, folks, if the administrative assistant to the director calls, that's the uh, same as the director calling you, so you better answer that phone call and you better know the answers. Patrolman Graham advised the writer that he had received a phone call from Ben Hale of the FBI office, who in turn told him he had received a phone call from an informant advising him that the next hostage situation involving police officers would be in the Lemoyne Gardens. According to Patrolman Graham, 
Ben Hale advised him that the informant told him that Lindbergh Sanders was known as the assistant god in the religion with no name. He further advised that there would be trouble or more trouble until the party known as God was in his religion with no name was identified. Ben Hale also gave the following names as being members of the, the religion with no name. Tim Coleman, 627 North 7th, if you, you'll remember him, that's one of, uh, it's one of the brothers to Michael Coleman. Melvin Davis T.C. Smith and a male black known only as Pete. This information came from the informant of Ben Hale. It sounds like pretty accurate information. He just named off several of the subjects that uh, whose names we've heard over and over again. On Wednesday, January 19, 1983, 2.10 p.m., the writer went to the Shelby County Medical Examiner's Office and picked up the bullets and bullet fragments recovered from the bodies of the seven deceased male blacks. The bullets and bullet fragments were tagged by the writer in the Memphis Police Department property room under the following property receipts. Four small sacks containing metal bullet fragments, which were recovered from the body of Michael Delane Coleman were tagged under property receipt number 83-13438. Two sacks containing bullet fragments recovered from the body of Larnell Sanders, tagged under receipt number 83-13439. Four small sacks containing bullet fragments recovered from the body of Earl Thomas was tagged under receipt number 83-13440. Zero. That is a lot of fragments to pull out of a body. A sack containing shotgun wide plastic and pellets recovered on the body of David Lee Jordan, along with a sack containing metal fragments recovered from the body of David Lee Jordan, was tagged by the writer under receipt number 8313. Four four one. Two sacks containing bullets and bullet fragments recovered from the body of Andrew Houston were tagged under property receipt number eighty three one three four four two. One sack containing bullet fragments recovered from the body of Cassell Harris was tagged under property receipt number eighty three one three four four three. Two sacks containing bullet fragments discovered from the body of Lindbergh Sanders were tagged under receipt number 83-13444. Should be noted that the writer did sign receipts for this evidence, which is hereto attached and is self-explanatory. On Thursday, January 20, 1983, the writer was instructed to go to the Memphis Police Department property room and check out the below listed evidence and take it to the toxicology lab. Now see folks, this is what you do. You 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 recover evidence on the scene. Well then when you get it, before you go take it off anywhere else, you always take that property to the property and evidence room, which is located at two oh one Poplar in the basement. It was back then and as far as I know, it still is today. It was when I was there. So you go down there and you tag it all. You get your property receipt numbers. And then what you're basically doing is is you're taking all that property and you're checking it right back out. And that's what they're doing here. So they can take it over to toxicology because you want to make sure there's a record of this is what was tagged. And then when you take it to toxicology or wherever it's going, if it's TBI for their ballistics or anything, that way you have a receipt of what that property is when you hand it over. And then when you get it back, you've got to make sure that that's the same property you gave them, that all of it's there. Anyways, I didn't mean to get carried away with that explanation. Receipt number 83 
13178 83 13237 and 813437 close of patrolman swill receipt number 813179 close of patrolman RS Hester receipt 813173 close of Thomas C Smith Receipt number 8313192, close of Earl Thomas. Receipt number 8313193, close of Lindbergh Sanders. Receipt number 8313195, close of Andrew Houston. Receipt number 8313197, close of Michael Coleman. Receipt number 8313196, close of David Jordan. Receipt number 13198, close of Larnell Sanders. Receipt number 831399, close of Cassell Harris. The writer also checked out the following list of items, which were tagged under... Property receipt number 8313431 to be taken to the toxicology lab. One, three cell Kel flashlight. One, MPD handy talkie. Number Alpha 33. One, yellow brown legal binder. One, two twenty three caliber cartridge cases. And one, shirt pocket flap with MPD stick pin. Now, right, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode. I'd hate to be that investigator. I had to check all that property out and have to get it to where it's supposed to go. That sure is a bunch of stuff to keep up with and a whole bunch of stuff you're going to have to go back and recover from toxicology and get it back to the property room or even worse you have to go pick it all up and you weren't the one that took it over there and you're hoping that the investigator took it over there actually tagged everything properly and got it over there in the first place and about a hundred ways stuff can go wrong and it's sure gonna look bad all right folks i appreciate y'all tuning in We'll get back together in a few days and hit it again. Folks, I almost forgot. we got to talk about our little red square up at the top there. That's a shadow box. And that's got the badges from the three agencies I work for. Got a badge and a patch. One on the very top, that's when I was a park ranger. State of Tennessee Department of Conservation. And then the next badge and patch, that's when I was with the Secret Service Uniform Division. That's the inauguration badge from 1988. George Herbert Walker Bush became president. Then that next, uh, that bottom set, that's my patrolman badge and sergeant badge when I was with Memphis. And as you can see, the date's 1983 to 2015. All right, folks. I almost forgot to tell that story, and I know how disappointed you all would have been. Other than that, I will see you down the road.